Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, May 23rd, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, an expert details how to spot modern day sex slaves. After that, we announce the winner of our latest contest and a liberal's worst nightmare, intelligent gun owners. That's next. So of course the Second Amendment takes such a massive precedence in my life in terms of what stays in my brain for the most part. And you know there are a bunch of, a bunch of other things that kind of fall into that line as well. Um, you know, I'm really big on the idea of honestly just freedom and not necessarily imparting somebody, somebody else's ideas on somebody else, yeah. right? Um, the idea that because I'm not for this, you shouldn't be for this. What are your thoughts about Hillary Clinton? Killery? Yeah, Killery. Killery Clinton. Um, I, I can't wait for Trump to be president and then we can put her on trial. In a story that broke this afternoon, CNN reports that Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe is under federal investigation for campaign contributions. Now, this is not unusual. What's unusual is that friends of the Clintons are even pointing out the corruption that's become so obvious. We talk about CNN often as being the Clinton News Network. They say Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe is the subject of an ongoing investigation by the FBI. And prosecutors from the Justice Department's Public Integrity Unit, U.S. officials briefed on the probe, say. The investigation dates to at least last year and is focused at least in part on whether donations to his gubernatorial campaign violated the law, say officials. Investigators have scrutinized McAuliffe's time as a board member of the Clinton Global Initiative, a vehicle of charitable foundation set up by former President Bill Clinton. Now, understand who this guy is for those of you who aren't in Virginia. First of all, Terry McAuliffe was a banker. Then from there, he became Bill Clinton's uh, co-chair of his campaign. Then he became DNC chair. Then he became Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. Then he became governor of Virginia. So he's a party apparatchik. And like these Clinton people and the DNC, we need to remember that going back into the 90s and in the early 2000s, we had massive scandals involving, guess what? Selling influence to some of the same people that he's suspected of selling influence to here. Remember that by the end of the second Clinton term, there were 21 people who had been found guilty of making illegal campaign contributions to the Clintons. And the way they would like to do that frequently is to run it through these charitable foundations. Of course, one of the most famous was Johnny Chung, who pled guilty. He showed up one day in Hillary Clinton's office with a check for $50,000. Now, he copped a plea and all he got was probation. The Clintons didn't go to jail either. So why would Terry McAuliffe then feel like he has to abide by any ethics regulations? Now the bottom line is, is that you've got a situation here where a guy who uh, puts in that kind of money, and of course there were many instances like this of influence peddling by the Clintons. Nobody went to jail, and yet look at what they did to Dinesh D'Souza, who was not expecting anything in return for the money that he donated to a former college friend who was running for political office. But because he gave more than the uh, maximum amount out of naivete, they sent him to jail, and he served real time, but not these guys, not Johnny Chung, and not these people. Okay, now Chung even said that he used his political access to get business deals from investors in China, and that was part of his plea bargaining. So it all comes out, mistakes were made, but nobody goes to jail. Now, what is going on with Terry McAuliffe? As they point out, among the donations that drew interest from the investigators was $120,000 from a Chinese businessman. No, not Johnny Chung, but a guy named Wang. Now, Wang was previously a delegate to China's National People's Congress, okay, their ceremonial legislature, because their government is really run by just a few guys. And so I guess we could start saying that our Congress is ceremonial. <laughs> it really doesn't make any decisions. It's now done by the executive along with the bureaucracies. They uh, regulate everything. Wang has also been a donator to the Clinton Foundation and pledged $2 million. But nothing to see. Just move along. Now, what all this gets for you, and as I point out, we've got um, a ceremonial legislature ourselves. The regulations are coming from the bureaucracy. It is legislation without representation. Look at this article here. 20,642 new regulations added during the Obama presidency. More than $22 billion per year in new regulatory costs were imposed on Americans last year. 
pushing the total burden for the Obama years to exceed $100 billion per year. Now, that's the regulatory cost. They said this is a dollar for every star in the galaxy, one for every second in 32 years. Now, some of the things in which they've uh, affected our lives, the way this red tape costs us, they point out is restricted access to credit because of the Dodd-Frank bill that was supposed to regulate the banks, but instead it regulates individuals. Fewer health care choices, of course, reduced Internet investment and innovation, and the Clean Power Act, which by itself will add $7.2 billion per year. Now, that doesn't include things like this effort by the EPA to impose millions of dollars in fines on an individual rancher because he had a, uh, eight acres and he put a small stock pond there that was approved by the state and local government. But then the EPA comes in and says, no, we own that. They put $37,000 a day in fines on him. He eventually beat that rap. But where is his compensation? Where is the regulation? Where is the mechanism by which we can control this out of control bureaucracy? And as we pointed out last week, Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, talked about Brexit and he said, look, there's, here's eight really strong and different reasons, not just immigration, folks. That's what uh, the Washington Post likes to talk about, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But he said, look at the cost that we have. We're having to spend, send from Britain to the European Union, a half a million dollars a week. And what do we get for that? Well, we get about 2,500 regulations. If you look at these regulations from the EPA, that's about 2,950 regulations that we're getting from them. Of course, we get 80,000 pages of uh, regulations each year, but in their accounting, they have 2,900 on average, uh, 2,950 throughout the seven years of Obama, just under 3,000 regulations, but we pay more than that. Just from Texas alone, we are paying three times what Britain does, and yet our economy is half the size of Britain. So we're paying six times what they're paying, and we're getting uh, more regulations. We're getting 3,000 instead of 2,500. So that's just one reason for Britain to leave the EU. It's another reason for Texas to leave uh, the United States because we can't get them to leave us alone. But look at the way the Washington Post spends it. And of course, the Washington Post is losing all of its little bit of credibility that it had left. Lately, they have gone on a, a spree of misrepresenting uh, not only Donald Trump, but now the British uh, leave, the Brexit movement. They say immigration backlash is at the heart of the British push to leave the European Union. And they say the anti-EU campaign's emphasis on metaphorically walling off the British Isles and in some cases demonizing immigrants as criminals, addicts, or as welfare cheats has generated comparisons to the xenophobia and the nativism of an another political movement that is shaking the Western political establishment this year. They say it is a transatlantic mirror of Donald Trump's program. Well, here's the commonality between the two. It fundamentally is not about xenophobia and racism. That's their arguing tactic. No, it is really a question of globalism versus nationalism. Are they going to destroy the sovereignty and local governance of these states that we have had that created the European Union? Or are we going to have a concentration? That's what is really at stake behind all of this. And of course, as one person that they talked to said, uh, we have an old fashioned view that the best people to run Britain are the British. That shouldn't be a radical concept. You see, it's about local government. It's about local control versus consolidation of power into one point where just a few people tell everyone else how to manage their economy and destroy individual sovereignty. Look at what's happening in Austria. There was a massive pushback, and of course, with an election as close as this Austrian election was, there is a high concern, pretty much a certainty, that it was rigged. But this is what the winning Green Party socialist says. Whoever loves Austria is shit, he says. Now, this is coming from an ad campaign that they had back in 2007. The Austrian Greens had a picture of a dog with an Austrian flag in its mouth with a poster said, take your flag for your gag, followed by the declaration that anyone who loves the country must be shit. They say the flag joke was a play on a campaign urging dog owners to place their dog's excrement in bags and in trash cans. They say it wasn't simply a gag or one-off incident, however. And so more recently, a leading green activist said, Austria is a lousy piece of shit when discussing the country's recent border controls to deal with Europe's migrant crisis. And they also point out that this guy who 
hates the sovereignty of Austria, is a son of Russian aristocrats. Okay? This is why we have the natural born citizen requirements in the Constitution. We can argue over the letter of the law. I think it's not that obscure. But the intent is to make sure that we don't have our countries, our cultures destroyed by people who come in without not only any respect for our laws by coming in, but who come in in such large numbers that they not only don't wish to assimilate, but they wish to deconstruct our country. Look at what the Pope is doing. We pointed out this uh, every, every day. The Pope does something else that is not involved with religion, not involved with Christianity, but is involved with politics. Today he met with the top imam, and he embraced uh, Islam in a historic Vatican meeting. Pope Francis embraced the Grand Imam of Cairo, or their largest mosque there, the Al-Azhar Mosque at the Vatican on Monday. This man is the highest authority in Sunni Islam, and the Pope said, our meeting is the message. In other words, the message you should take away from this meeting is that we are meeting here. We're having a peace conference. There he is again, crying peace, peace, when there is no peace. He says, we need to take a joint stance. We need hand in hand to bring happiness to humanity. Divine religions were revealed to make people happy, not to cause them hardship. Hmm. Well, okay, I have to ask, is this what Islam imposes? Does it impose any hardship, or is it just there to make people happy? Uh, is it making Christians in Saudi Arabia happy? Is it making women happy when it oppresses them? Is it making gays happy when it throws them off of roofs? See, the problem with this is the fact that the Pope, as we pointed out last week, has criticized our efforts in the West to try to bring democracy and tolerance to Islamic countries, while he praises Muslims who come here. He has nothing to say about Jesus, and yet what he represents is a merging of religion and politics, because all the Pope talks about is politics, how he can deconstruct Western society, deconstruct free markets, and impose a global world governance on what we do here. And so yet we see yet another example of that. And look at what Obama does when he sells us his religion. We've got Obama appointing a transgender person to an advisory faith council. Uh, this person is uh, David Satin. And I have to look at this and I say, well, first of all, besides appointing a transgender person to his advisory faith council, why would we have an advisory faith council from the American government? I thought we were supposed to have this wall of separation, the liberals tell us, between church and state. So why do we have an advisory faith council as a federal government function? Why do they get involved at all? See, the wall of separation was supposed to wall in the federal government. That phrase is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It was simply a letter that Thomas Jefferson sent to some people who were concerned that he was going to come around and confiscate their Bibles. That's what John Adams was telling people during the campaign. And so he said, no, 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 there is a wall of separation between the government and you. In other words, the government is walled in. And yet now we have the government selling us its values, propagating its values, threatening to take school lunches away from poor children if we don't allow their transgender tyranny, as we see from Barack Obama. And that's precisely what we're seeing from the Pope. You know, going back to this meeting here, he said he presented this imam, who is the highest imam uh, of Sunni religion, with a copy of his recent encyclical, a letter to the faithful in which he urges the world to wake up to the threat posed by climate change and economic inequality. You see, it is a merging of religion and state that makes what the Pope is doing so dangerous. It is a merging of religion and state, which is what makes Islam dangerous. And it is a merging of Obama's social engineering as if it were a religious value that makes what he is doing so dangerous. This is the key here. And he adds that the imam wants to promote true Islam. Well, true Islam is really a merging of church and state. Where are the people who have a problem with that in the liberal agenda? Now, look at this last story here. We have a security guard who was arrested in Washington, D.C. She was arrested for removing a man from a woman's bathroom. Female security guard working at a Washington, D.C. grocery store was arrested Monday afternoon, this last Monday, for physically escorting a woman out of the woman's room after 
he refused to leave because he identifies himself as a woman, he says. He says. Now, they said this was a suspected hate crime. In other words, it was hateful for this female security guard to remove this man out of the restroom because she perceived him as a threat, as an affront. He says that he was emotionally traumatized by the incident. Do we care if women and children are emotionally traumatized by men going into the restrooms because they feel like it? We don't care about the vast majority of people. No, for this transgender tyranny, we are going to let the small minority lord it over everyone else. And he says, um, the security guard told him, you guys cannot keep coming in here and using our women's restroom. They did not pass the law yet. See, that's the problem. They really don't care what women and young girls believe about this, how they feel about this. They don't want to protect them or even have any concern about their emotional trauma about this. All right, stay with us when we come back from break. Jakari Jackson has a special report on sex trafficking, and we're going to cover what's being called the gun apocalypse in California, sweeping regulations that will control even ammunition. Maybe we should call it Ammogeddon. We'll be right back. It seems like every day there's a new story about exploitation of human beings. Oftentimes these are sexual in nature and include things like forced prostitution. They also include things like forced labor, slavery. And with more on this, here's my conversation with Laramie Gorbett of the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault. Well, my job is to provide training and technical assistance in the area of human trafficking and sexual assault. So I do a lot of training with law enforcement. Um, we do lots of trainings with Homeland Security and specifically how to identify victims of trafficking. Um, a big part of the training is identifying the difference between smuggling and trafficking and the, the vulnerabilities of people who are smuggled and how they are likely to be eventually victims of trafficking. We do training on um, trauma-informed investigations, so how you actually um, are able to investigate and interview victims from a trauma-slash-victim-centered um, perspective so that you are not re-traumatizing the victim or the survivor. Can you uh, define that distinction between human trafficking and smuggling? Sure. Smuggling is a crime against a nation, against a sovereign nation or border. Um, human trafficking is a crime against a person. It's a, a human rights or a civil rights violation. When you look at human trafficking, there are several different components. You have domestic minor trafficking, which could be um, labor trafficking or sex trafficking, and then you have international trafficking, which could be sex trafficking or labor trafficking. Um, and there are many different subcategories, including forced prostitution, um, commercially exploited children, etc. There are far more victims of trafficking than are being identified, but that's one of the jobs that we have is to go and to do these trainings, to specifically to look for victim indicators um, that somebody has been uh, a victim of force, fraud, and coercion. And a lot of times is, do they have access to their own documents? Do they have their passport? Do they have ID? Do they have, do they have access to money? Do they have keys? Where are they staying? Are they kept all in one area? Do they live where they work? Um, are there signs of um, physical abuse, torture, cigarette burns, broken bones, bruises? Um, do they, are they free to leave, to come and go? Um, these are just some of the, the basic indicators. Um, if somebody is trying to discern whether or not this is a smuggling situation or whether this is a trafficking situation. Um, and somebody who's experienced complex trauma, somebody that's been physically abused, sexually abused, um, either prior to being trafficked or as a direct result of being trafficked, they don't just come forward with that information. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's very difficult for law enforcement because they're trying to get information to do their job, to put the bad guys away. And with somebody who's experienced trauma, you don't just come forward with that information. That's not just an easy thing to say, especially when you've been threatened. You say, if you tell anybody what's happening here, then this is going to happen to you, or this is going to happen to your family. And so that's where the complexities come of being able to establish a rapport with the victim, being able to establish um, you know, services for them where they have their medical needs addressed, where they have um, food, water, shelter, and feel safe that they can then 
kind of disclose some of the things that happened to them for the investigation, but also for, for their own well-being. And that's one of the things that we do is when we have these trainings, um, kind of connecting the dots with law enforcement, with the people investigating these cases, and the, the rape crisis centers, the domestic violence shelters that will then come in to provide those services. And it's not easy. If you are trying to have a conversation with somebody and their, their abuser, their trafficker, their enforcer is right over here, are they gonna be able to do that? No. Um, if they haven't eaten in three days, if they um, are wearing dirty underwear and have been chained to a bed for a week at a time, is that a situation where they're gonna feel physically comfortable and emotionally comfortable enough to open up? No. And so that's one of the, the, the difficult things about conducting these interviews. Um, are they in a safe place? Have they had a chance to eat? Have they had a chance to sleep? Have they been given clothes? Are you even speaking their language? Um, and still breaking them those barriers of fear and distrust, which those are survival mechanisms. That's what's kept them alive to this, this point. And so being able to collaborate with people who have training in trauma-informed care and understand about what happens to you physically and emotionally and neurologically when you experience complex trauma. And so having those things kind of set up ahead of time makes a really big difference. And even having a place to go, because if you take a victim of trauma and you put them in um, an interrogation room, then they're gonna feel like criminals and they're already scared. And you know, it's already in a situation that is unfamiliar to them um, in a situation that would be um, alarming to most people, let alone somebody that's experienced this kind of violence. So those are just all things to keep um, in mind um, and things still have to happen. You know, people still do their investigations and they're trying to get the information and a lot of times people are under a time crunch. Um, and it's one of the reasons why this is so complex. For those who participate in the activities, for the uh, people who are driving up the demand, mm -hmm. in your personal opinion, are there stiff enough penalties no. legally? No, absolutely not. Um, and in fact, if we talk about you know domestic minor sex trafficking or we talk about um, domestic tra sex trafficking in general, a lot of times victims are treated like criminals. And even the language that um, people use, whether it's law enforcement or the media, when you talk about a 14-year-old prostitute, there are no 14-year-old prostitutes. 14-year-olds can't legally consent to sex. They're actually uh, victims of trafficking, they are commercially exploited children, they are victims of child abuse or sexual assault. There's no 14-year-old prostitute. And so the way that we talk about victims of trafficking, the way that we talk about prostitutes, you know, that's, um, that's problematic in and of itself, but also how they're treated as far as if, are they arrested for prostitution? Are they charged? Are they given access to resources and counseling and emergency housing and crisis intervention and all of that? And then what happens to the Johns, the people that are buying the sex? Um, and in a lot of cases, it's considered a misdemeanor to buy sex from an adult. So addressing the demand can happen through laws but it also happens through changing the way we think about women, about children, um, about sex and gender, and not um, adhering to a value system where you automatically think of a woman or a child as a sexual object. So I mean, and that's far more complex and a, a lot bigger conversation, but that's one part of it. So yes, laws, um, that affect actually paying for sex is one thing, um, but also having a mentality um, of where you are seeing the value of humans outside of their potential for profit. There are a lot of resources available. There, we always need more, but there are a lot of resources out there. Um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is a great resource um, for parents, for educators, for um, teens to find out specifically about the vulnerabilities of, of children being exploited sexually. Um, it's also, they, they partner with law enforcement and the FBI to connect um, missing children um, along with children that are being exploited 
um, sexually online. So that is a, a good resource, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Also, there, um, the Polaris Project is an organization that provides a lot of data specifically on trafficking, um, labor trafficking, and sex trafficking. Uh, locally, there is the Central Texas Coalition Against Human Trafficking that, that meets here in Austin that's made up of law enforcement, social service providers, faith-based and community-based organizations um, coming together to talk about what's happening in the field. Also, there's Allies Against Slavery that's here in, in Austin, um, and Refugee Services of Texas is one of uh, the other points of contact as far as providing direct services to survivors of trafficking. The well, New York Times points out that there is a fight going on in California between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. A big fight as to who's going to win there because Bernie believes that he's going to be able to make the case for super delegates to switch to him if he can pull off a big win in California. Well, good luck with that. But the presidential race uh, draws attention to the fact that there really is an arms race going on in California right now. And that's a race to take away our arms. It's a race between the president of the Senate and the current lieutenant governor, who both want to become the next Democrat governor. So they are trying to show their bona fides in terms of gun control measures there. And that is a slight difference between Bernie and Hillary. Bernie has a D minus from the NRA, but even Bernie Sanders will not hold parties responsible for things that were crimes that were committed with guns, like gun manufacturers and even movie theaters, like Hillary Clinton wants to do. Remember, it was just this last week that a court found that victims of the Aurora, Colorado shooting, where there was the Dark Knight showing, could not be held, they could not hold Cinemark responsible for the deaths of the people there. Of course, that was an act by a criminal individual. And the theater didn't have anything to do with it. Neither did the makers of the movie. And neither did the makers of the gun. There's even a congressional uh, piece of legislation that makes that clear. Nevertheless, Hillary Clinton would move against that. And we see what's happening in California. We've got now what is being called by guns.com a gun apocalypse. 11 fast-tracked anti-gun bills sweeping the California Senate, just to get an idea of what's at stake here. Measures to require mandatory registration of ghost guns, guns that you largely manufacture yourself. Retroactive bans on currently grandfathered firearms and magazines going back to 1899, so antiques are going to be banned. They're going to outlaw the use of bullet buttons. That's a device to uh, make sure that you can change your magazine without using special tools. Uh, they founded a state-run firearm violence research center, which will create gun control propaganda as if it were a health care issue. They're going to make all gun theft a felony offense. They're going to criminalize loans of guns between friends, and they're going to require the reporting of stolen guns. And I assume that that would be a felony if you don't do that as well. And then there's going to be three bills focusing on ammunition alone. There will be bills that will mandate background checks for ammunition purchases, as well as collecting and saving sales tax information when people purchase ammunition. So maybe we ought to call it ammo getting. You know, there really isn't much place to look if we're going to look at the Second Amendment uh, outside of the Republicans and Democrats, even the person who's being touted as the vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party has supported assault weapon bans. With the Democrat nominees working as hard as they can to take away our gun rights, with even the libertarians soft on the right to keep and bear arms, the NRA endorsed Donald Trump. And we have a special report from Joe Biggs, who is at the NRA convention in Kentucky. Hey, this is Joe Biggs with Infowars.com, and I'm standing here with... Calling on Noir. And uh, you are like one the of the... Uh, sexy and stuff, I yeah. <laughs> You're one of the faces of the NRA, right? I, I guess. I, I guess. So let's get in a little bit of politics. You know, you, you, <laughs> you know, the NRA came out. They're saying that they're, mm -hmm. they, they've endorsed Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. How do you what, do you what do you think about all that? A bit indifferent. As far as I'm concerned, I'm largely one issue voter for the most part. Um, if you're not doing anything that's in contrast to how I feel about the Second Amendment for the most part, then we're in line. Um, I know the people who are adamantly against it, and I know the people who are questionably for it. So that's kind of where I am right now. What do you think one of the most important topics in America today is, besides the Second Amendment right now, something else that you really care a lot about that you'd like to see taken care of with this next president? So, of course, the Second Amendment takes such a massive precedence mm -hmm. in my life in terms of what stays in my brain for the most part. And you know there are a bunch of, a bunch of other things that kind of fall into that line as well. Um, you know, I'm really big on the idea of 
honestly, just freedom and not necessarily imparting somebody, somebody else's ideas on somebody else, yeah. right? Um, the idea that because I'm not for this, you shouldn't be for this. I think from a 30,000 foot view, the Second Amendment is always going to be the biggest issue because it's the one thing that symbolizes the concept of freedom, which is inherent, which this country is about. So it's hard for me to really sit back and say, okay, any other issues as far as I'm concerned that directly affect me, it's hard to say because the Second Amendment is literally takes that much of a precedence in my life. So it, you're going to be here for about another 30 minutes for me to think about something else that's really... So what's the, mo what's the most important to you, security or freedom? And it's kind of a trick question. Freedom. Because what? Because I can, I can, I can create my security with my freedom. Yeah. I won't necessarily have freedom with security, and I may not even like the security to begin with. So. Right on. Well, thanks, man. Absolutely. Now we're at the 2016 NRA annual meeting in Louisville, Kentucky, and with me is Amy Jane. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? So, is this your first event so far? Or have you been to many? This is my first NRA show. I absolutely love it. I was scared it was going to be like SHOT Show. It's really, you know, high stress and everyone's running around. It's crazy and it's actually really calm. Everyone's really cool. I'm super stoked and it's definitely not going to be my last one. So what's some of the uh, the guns that you've seen here so far that you really like? Oh my goodness. Um, they, we actually have a, at Trijicon has a wall of movie guns. They have uh, John Wick's gun. They have Lone Survivor gun. They have all these crazy, amazing guns that you should go check out. Um, Benelli has a John Wick shotgun. So I'm all about that stuff. So tell me about yourself. You uh, you shoot, you do a lot of different things. So who do you shoot for, all that? I mostly shoot for Terran Tactical Innovations, which is somewhere on here. I'm also sponsored by 511 Tactical, Blade Tech, all the really cool people, Tough, Dewey Rods, the list goes on. <laughs> but yeah, um, mostly Taryn Butler, who's right over there, if you want to get a shot of that guy. <laughs> He's running. <laughs> it's a political uh -huh. atmosphere now. You uh -huh. know, Donald Trump was just here, uh, what was it? Uh, Friday, yes. uh, the day I got here, and uh, NRA came out and endorsed them. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's phenomenal. I support anyone who supports my gun rights, um, all of our gun rights, because that's how it should be. So, what do you, what are you, what, what are your thoughts about Hillary Clinton? Killery? Yeah, Killery. Killery Clinton. Um, I, I can't wait for Trump to be president, and then we can put her on trial. So, tell me some of the things that do you ever do any kind of political stuff or gun rights? Do you go out to I don't know, uh, like activist events, do you protest at all for that or do you get involved locally in California with anything? I usually don't have the time because I work like 18 jobs and I'm constantly all over the place. Um, but I do know that there was like a mass email going around where some political stuff was going on in California, which is my state, uh, where they were just kind of passing laws like kind of, oh, we're just going to pass this and not really mention it to anybody. So if there's like an email that I can write to somebody or um, forwarding posts or reposting something to get other people's attention to do the same because, you know, the strength in numbers. Um, then I'll do that, um, but it's kind of all I really have time to do. Um, so I will definitely support uh, when I can. All right, so last question, security or freedom? Both. D, all of the above. I don't <laughs> well, security security as in the government saying they're going to take care of you or freedom, oh, freedom. for you. Freedom, 110%. Freedom. All right, well, there you have it. Amy <laughs> Jane wants freedom, so do we, and we want our gun rights. Yeah. Amy Jane for Trump, and <laughs> Amy Jane for gun rights. And I'm sitting here with Taryn Butler. How are you doing today, sir? Good, how are you doing? So everyone's seen that you know video of uh, Keanu Reeves, and uh, here we are at the Trijicon booth. We're at the NRA meeting in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Tell us about some of these guns and what it is you do. Well, uh, I'm a competitive shooter, three-gun, multi-gun for years, pistol matches, IDPA, all that crazy stuff. And uh, I've been lucky enough to be able to be working with Hollywood, living in Hollywood in that area, uh, training actors for films and stuff like that. And uh, we've uh, been training Keanu Reeves for films coming up, and he just likes to shoot. And these are some of the guns. This is the TR-1 Ultralight AR-15. It's got a Trijicon uh, TR-24 on top, the RMR on the side. This is the one from the viral video. It's a light, fast little rifle. Got all the great parts on it, BCM, Voltor, LaRue Tactical. It's a great little gun. So I got a question for you. We just have, basically we figured out who the presumptive GOP nominee is, Donald Trump. The NRA has come out and endorsed him. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I hope he makes it. I think he will make a difference. It won't be just another company man, get me in there, and then just, I made it, I'm president, let's just stop. I'm going to go golfing. And I think, I mean, look, he's a little, he does fun, crazy stuff to get attention, whatever, but I really think... Yeah, absolutely, that's the choice we have. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty huge victory for the Second Amendment, don't you think? To have that endorsement for him and to see that he is now the most voted for GOP nominee in the history of America—that's pretty big. No, it's awesome. And I saw Shooting USA, where his 
two, his two sons are gun nuts, loading ammo, shooting, and all that stuff. I'd love to have him come out and shoot sometime, but absolutely support him 100%. What, what other choice we have, you know? You and uh, kill it. Uh, and what do you think, security or freedom? Freedom. And why is that? What, what, is, what is freedom to you? Uh, having the freedoms that we have with guns and the stuff that we're doing, you know? Being safe. I don't want to be secured in some little room. Yeah, you don't want to be, uh, you don't want a big brother watching over you and kind of telling you what to do. You want to have that freedom to protect yourself, right? Of course. Yeah. Right. This has been Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. An article from Wired Magazine says scientists are just as confused as you are about the ethics of big data research. Well, I'm not really confused about ethics. See, the problem is, is that we have rejected the privacy arguments, the constitutionality arguments, we've rejected moral absolutes. It was at the turn of the last century that we had an intelligence officer say, gentlemen, don't read other gentlemen's emails. That was a moral absolute. We don't have that anymore. So now we operate in this relativistic fog, and this is what they have to say. When a rogue researcher last week released 70,000 OK Cupid profiles, complete with usernames and sexual preferences, People were pissed. When Facebook researchers manipulated how stories appear in news feeds for a mood contagion study in 2014, not to mention what they did to conservatives that we've now learned about, they say people were really pissed. And of course, Wired doesn't talk about that conservative issue. Say, so shockingly, though, researchers behind both of those big data blow ups never really anticipated public outrage. And that shows just how untested the ethics of this new field of research is. We'll see, it's not really. A problem, as I mentioned, when you throw out uh, the moral absolutes, when you say the Constitution is a living document, it means whatever we want it to mean now, and it just floats with the sea change of ethics, and we don't have our ethics tied to any moral standard, any religious standard, it just floats. This is what we get. Now, they talk about the common rule that is applied to federally funded research, and they talk about how it has its origins in the medical community. They say the common rule and other systems are born out of the outrage over mistakes, mistakes like the Tuskegee experiment. Well, that was hardly a mistake. <laughs> you know, when you get caught red-handed uh, giving people syphilis and uh, then lying to them and saying you're gonna give them a treatment, that's hardly a mistake, okay? That's part of the ethical failure that we have here. But of course, we haven't really learned anything from that. We still have people calling for mandated vaccines and telling anyone who wants to question that that they just need to shut up. We're not going to tolerate that. We have a story from Infowars.com by Don Salazar saying that Robert De Niro is revealing a new project in an interview that he was uh, giving in Cannes Film Festival. And he also talks about the controversy behind the documentary Vaxxed. Now, he said that uh, he learned, first of all, that there was a big reaction that he didn't see coming when he was going to put Vaxxed in his Tribeca Film Festival. And then he removed it because of that reaction. Where did that reaction come from? Well, he points out it came from filmmakers, the very people who should know better, the very people who should stand the strongest for the First Amendment and for an open discussion of ideas, the filmmakers were the ones, he said, put the pressure to shut this down. He says the movie was not hurting anybody. It says something. It said something to me that was valid because he has a son who got autism shortly after his son was vaccinated. So he is very interested in the connection there, as many other people uh, have pointed out. It's not just celebrities, but of course, unfortunately, this is something that has touched many, many people's lives. He's while saying he wouldn't advocate a second time for Vax to be screened at Tribeca, he hinted that his new documentary film that will be produced with movie mogul Harvey Weinstein may focus on revealing the financial motivations behind vaccine manufacturers, as well as highlighting pharmaceutical companies' ties to government agencies like the CDC. And De Niro said, there's big, big money in vaccines that the CDC will put out there and mandate for people. Of course, there's a profit motive. And let's hope that he looks at that and gets people to say, that, you know, just because the CDC or the government says that something is okay doesn't make it okay. There's such a thing as regulatory capture. There's also such a thing as being bought off by big money interest. And there's also such a thing as gagging people. You know, earlier today on the radio show, we talked about how Tom Brokaw, former anchor of NBC News, when we got all of our news through just three sources, said at a commencement exercise in the University of Mississippi, if we have more guns, more firearm tolerance will mean more homegrown acts of terror. 
See, that's what we saw when we just had those three networks. They were skewing the information. Look at what we learned this weekend. Uh, this article via uh, the Drudge Report points out how U.S. companies are concentrating the cash with just the largest uh, companies owning a third of all the cash that's out there held by uh, companies other than banks. They point out that just five tech companies hold $500 billion in cash between them, which is a third of the $1.7 trillion on the balance sheets of non-banks. Now, these five companies are Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, which is Google, Cisco, and Oracle. So they've got $500 billion. The next $600 billion is the next 45 largest companies. Think about that. Five companies have $500 billion. The next 45 companies combined have as much as those five companies. And then the rest of all the corporations have another $600 billion. So you got $500 billion by five companies, $600 billion by the next 45 largest, and $600 billion by the rest of the corporations in the United States. That's the kind of concentration of power that we're looking at. And of course, we've pointed out in the past that just five media giants control 90% of everything you hear. That's why it's so important for you to support independent media like InfoWars. And we really do appreciate your support. That's why we have these contests from time to time. Here's the latest winner of our latest contest. Right now, let's go here from the war room. We've got the radio original studio we call the Situation Room. So I can cut to other reporters and breaking news. Uh, but we now have the uh, new, what will we call this? The command base or, or, or the lair of McAdoo? Or do we call it the TV studio? Because uh, really, this is a TV studio, too. But it's good to have these so we can just always have folks working, doing more. We're going to try to do some radio news down the road. We're doing a lot of stuff, obviously, uh, here with the great network, uh, GCNlive.com, the folks over there in Minnesota. But we're down here in Austin, Texas. So let's go now. I now take you back to Austin, Texas, uh, about 60, 70 yards from where I sit through that wall, uh, to Leanne McAdoo and Marley Jones, the lovely Marley Jones. I can say that she's my sister, and I uh, look so cute <laughs> over there. And uh, she's she's like 28, but she's always my baby sister. I'll <laughs> squeeze her. Anyways, a lot of employees around that didn't know Marley. I'll, I'll call her over and like kiss her, and they're like, "What are you doing kissing this employee?" And I'm kissing her. <laughs> but, hey, but seriously, Marley, uh, uh, Leanne, tell us what we got. Who the winner is? I want you to choose who the winner is of the Instagram contest at uh, Real underscore Alex Jones. Okay, well, we have been tallying up the votes for the last uh, couple of hours during the show, and a lot of people have been taking the poll. So I'm viewing the results right now, making sure they're the most updated. And it looks like with 298 votes, Makeda or Makata is going to be the winner. Makata. <laughs> so congratulations. Sorry if I'm your name wrong. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we have a winner of the thousand dollars. She'll be the young lady wearing the Hillary for Prison T-shirt. There. Can we put yes. her on screen? The big winner. There you go. She's the winner. She got the most votes. That's awesome. Hillary for Prison 2016. The shirts are available 50% off today, and then it is over at InfoWarsStore.com. When you sign up for the free email, you, we will send you the promo code. Get 50% off that. And 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 again. We have millions of followers on Facebook and so much more. We, we only have, I don't know, 40,000 or whatever it is on Instagram. We need people to follow it. So it's another avenue to reach out to people. We need to grow that. So please follow us there. Uh, just like, you know, we have a few hundred <laughs> votes here. We just posted this today just as a fun idea. You know, when we have our own poll on InfoWars, it gets like 40,000 votes. Drudge gets like a million votes. So we need to really get folks to vote more in these because it's all part of, you know, people being involved and, and basically giving us your feedback and your views. So thank you for voting. Those that did, we're going to have more and more of these contests. Uh, Leanne, Marley, uh, Marley was a little nervous there. Uh, just jump in any time. Go ahead. I mean, overall, very successful contest. It's great to see InfoWarriors out there. Yeah, I could not believe the amount of people that were using the InfoWars gear hashtag. There were so many people, thousands of people. Yeah, it was definitely really great to see all the activity. And I just wanted to let you know you can keep using that hashtag. We want to keep looking at all your photos. We want to keep seeing your support. We're going to use those in our newsletter, on our website. So anytime you see anything that shows you're active in the community, hashtag it InfoWars Gear. We're going to be looking at it every single day. We just want to give you guys a way to show like what you're doing and make sure your voice is heard and that you're sharing it with your friends and talking about it. So keep going on it. And you're building the, the community of Info Warriors out there. So it's great. Next, we'll get you on Snapchat, Alex. I think you'll love that. <laughs> hey, you ladies are just doing a great job over there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you. What do you think of the new studio, Leanne? I like it. 
Uh, everyone compliments this this new studio. It's it's very large. I think it's going to be excellent when we get all of us here. You know. Well, that's really it. we have all these reporters and guests. We're like we're doing election <laughs> coverage and things. We're gonna have a couple people in here, and then a couple right. in there, and then that way people get breaks. People say, "Well, I have a bunch of studios." Well, that's why Fox and CNN do that too. You can like get up, go get more yeah. stuff, stuff ready, come back, have a break. Again, thank you for your support of Infowars. We really do appreciate that. That's our news for tonight. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.